Hello and welcome to this episode of High Tea with me, Evelyn Brink and Lars Friedrich. Hello and welcome. This time it took a little bit longer, but we promise you we prepared some very extra special and whatever ingredients. It is going to be a very interesting high tea. Promise. A potent concoction for your viewing pleasure. And today's topic is take the lead. We're going to talk about what leadership actually means, what styles are conducive, and Lars coming from the top management coaching position and me coming from the coaching wild creatives position, you can imagine we have some quite uh, differentiating views, to put it mildly and diplomatically. So enjoy, sit back, and let's take the lead. Lars, Let's, let's talk about what leadership means for you. Coming from the management world and the military world, how, you, how do you even define leadership and why is it so important? Well, leadership for me, as you just said, our understanding of leadership styles is a little bit different. I experienced in high-level leadership or high-level management and military, a more kind of very disciplined and a very kind of action-oriented leadership. So you don't have the time to uh, find a decision with a team or don't waste time. You can't be too creative. You just have to kind of do these kind of top level executive decisions. They need to be made. So you have to kind of take them and you really have to take the lead in the end. Which is completely the opposite of a lot of the creative world. If somebody was leading actors in a play that way, you wouldn't get much good out of them. Or if we're, if we're talking about any creative process, really the idea of leadership is the ability of creating a space, opening a, 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 opening a space for things to come forward. And then, and then the ability of taking the best of what comes forward and, and putting it to the front. Right. That is true. Um, but if you, just, if you just take it from perspective of um, high achievers, this is a few levels below what they do. We're talking about the difference of taking the lead in top level management and taking the lead in any other kind of management. So the decision making process, cooperation involving the team, this is a level that is not happening really anymore in the kind of top level management. Sadly, mm -hmm. but that's what is true. And you can imagine kind of, uh, when we kind of switch quickly to military, it's an environment under fire where you don't have the luxury of having kind of team meetings during any kind of mission under fire to kind of uh, argue about which kind of tactics might be the most fruitful in this moment in time. You simply don't have the time. And in that way, the military and uh, top level management really are quite alike in that domain. Leadership also comes, and we discussed this before, with the ability to lead yourself first. Yeah, so when I think about leading myself first, and I think that I am the top management in the system, Evelyn, I really don't want to lead myself from that super decisive, this is what we're going to do, action place. I am quite interested in leading myself from a more gentle, open space that, that, is, that allows for growth, that allows for gentle moving forward. Now, I'm not saying that I can't push myself, but I'm very mindful about, about the kind of dictatorship qualities that we can throw in when we when we lead and make decisions and kind of come from that more how we're going to call it i almost want to say masculine place but i don't know if that's the right way to say it but hmm. what you're talking about is a position where you've got some time to decide and again as you just said it the masculine approach the active approach so to say mm -hmm. is uh, a very nice tool when the decision has to be made immediately you simply don't have time, the decision needs to be made. And most of the time, it's not even a decision that's made out of the kind of cognitive, kind of thinking about it, overthinking it. So no time for creative overthinking, as I call it. It's a gut decision, you have to make it, so you just make it. And the other um, part that you were kind of referring to, um, I call it the playful part. The playful part is very important as well. And you need time for this kind of playful part to explore, to discover, to kind of uh, weighing in different options, what might be possible, what might follow out of this. Mm -hmm. But again, 
out of uh, from my from my point of view, these are more kind of approaches when you've got more time for decision that needs to be made. I quite like this idea of having a, a, a more masculine way, more active way of making a decision and a more feminine way. And I'm hearing about the time aspect and but checking in with myself, I can make a decision very quickly also guided from intuition or from the gut instinct, however we wanna, if we wanna give it a gender or not. But it seems to be less of a time question and more of a, a f energetic frequency or, or where I'm coming from question. So different environments need a different approach. And a good a leader is somebody who can recognize what that environment is and adapt to that. I would love to Absolutely. translate this into the coaching profession now. What does this mean for us as coaches? Yes, no, no leadership style is right. No leadership style is wrong. There's a leadership style for every occasion, for every time, for every decision that needs to be made. How do you see it, Lars? Because sometimes when I hear people talk about leadership and in the coaching world, there's so much talk about leadership. There's this part of me that goes, oh, God, not again. Leave me alone. Do I always have to be in this leadership place? Sometimes we also need to know how to follow. Sometimes I just want to relax. Is, is that even allowed in your world? Oh, absolutely. I can tell you every, every good leader needs to have the ability to follow. And as you were just talking about our profession, I'm, I'm not a mean guy, but let me just ask you, how many of, of the guys who are talking about leadership have been really leaders? So who of the guys who is, for example, has managers as, as their clients, has been in a management position before and knows what these guys are really doing? Um, it might help if you're an expert in that way, even if being a coach, does not necessarily mean you have to be an expert. But in terms of leadership, it helps if you have been in their shoes. And I think lots of times it gets us because people talking about leadership who don't have the slightest idea what it feels, what it means to lead, and the most important thing, what it means to follow. So following is the most basic form of leadership that every leader needs to know by heart. Interesting. So we both agree on the fact that we sometimes also want or need to follow. And then the question is, oh, who do we follow and, and why? Because if I'm a follower, I'm by default not leading, but I should be leading. So what's what now? Well, it's, it's quite easy. You should follow, first and foremost, you should follow yourself. You should follow yourself. You should follow your own lead. Show people how to become leaders. They, yeah, themselves instead of following others that might be much more fruitful mm. so follow yourself because you are the most important leader for your own kind of life that's a point that i can absolutely agree with was that what was the other point that you and me disagreed with it was when it came to the word trying right i heard you talk about trying very passionately in my world, there's a lot of trying and a lot of making room for new things. Let's try something different. Well, you've done it this way before. How about we try it this way now? And I've heard you speak very passionately about not using the word try. Tell us more. Right. So if you really look closely into the word trying, where it comes from, you will realize, so I'm talking about psychologically as well, it does something actually to your mind because it gives you reason to fail. Yeah, before you start now to kind of argue and kind of attack me, take some time to research it and you're going to find it. So what it does when you're a leader and you kind of stay, sit in front or you kind of stand in front of your pack and kind of start sentences that imply the word trying, saying like, let's try doing this and this. You're actually losing all credibility. You will never find any high achievers, top level executives who use any sentences with trying. What you kind of actually um, love to use as trying, I always call playing. So what we love to do is playing around. We like to discover, we like to, to juggle with things, uh, explore stuff, going in deeper, have fun doing other stuff. But it's more playing because this is exactly what children do as well in their development. But it's not trying. You will never hear a child saying trying unless 
it learned this sentence later on from adults. Yeah, which they do. In my world, trying in my world, is simply not existing because, as I just said before, it implies failure. And as a leader, you directly lose all credibility. Now, with the word failure, I want to go on to that as well. It's like the big bad thing. What if failure wasn't that bad a thing? What if failure was seen as feedback? That's what I learned in my first coaching course. Failure is really feedback. I'm saying it with an American accent because that's where often this, <laughs> this uh, knowledge comes from. But what do you say to that? What if failure is really just feedback? What's the big deal? Again, consider my background and you know that failure is luxury that most people can't afford. If failure yeah, has kind of a big kind of uh, consequences, what you want to do is avoid failure. And you don't yeah. want to kind of play with failure and make failure a thing to, yeah, to be playful with and to kind of uh, even embrace failure. It's a, different it's a different kind of way to kind of perceive failure. Absolutely, and I think this is where, this is where we can differentiate an opinion. I'm, I'm just reflecting back on people, often people that have become very wealthy talk about having been bankrupt a couple of times. So they've had massive failure, but that's what they needed or used to really learn and grow. So I'm thinking that the attitude of being relaxed towards failure can be conducive to learning and growing. I want to get it right all the time. I just noticed it's not necessarily a helpful attitude to have to get it right. I neither agree nor disagree because you're, you're spot on. So let's talk about personal leadership. What does, what does personal leadership mean to you? Because we have different views on that. So for me, Personal leadership is the way that I relate to myself. And I've noticed that I can be my worst critic and certainly my clients tend to be the absolute worst critic. So my job as a coach is to help them have a more gentle relationship with themselves so that they can actually perform more. And when I say perform, I don't mean, eh, I mean that they can do more and that they can achieve more because you need to be sustainable. So for me, personal leadership is a lot to do with how can I be loving to myself what about you, Lars? I take the, the Eastern approach again, which is due to my martial arts experience. And for me, it's really about balance. So um, I'm, uh, yeah, the, I'm, I'm not doing the sweet talking. So I'm not taking it too slow, as I always call it. I'm quite driven and uh, goal oriented. And uh, this is exactly the same approach my clients expect me to give them. So my clients expect me to really very open, very pushy, and very bold. That's what they expect me to do, and that's what they want me to do, because when we start in the coaching, we uh, agree on the kind of goals, the task, or whatever they want to achieve. And most of the time, it really needs a little bit of pushing. Having said that, as I just said, I use loads of the, the oriental kind of attitude of keeping things in balance, of not losing this kind of what we call these days work-life balance, and to remind them to sometimes taking a step back, take a rest, get the bigger picture, and then start anew or kind of take a different approach, take a different road, might be the better option than that just pushing through and just running the whole time being in a struggle the whole time. As I just said, it's not about being, it sounds almost, almost a little bit strange, not being too gentle on yourself. It's quite goal-oriented. Mm -hmm. So the goal being the outcome that your clients want to produce or that you want to produce? On my level, it's the outcome that I want to, of course, to produce, that I want to reach. Mm -hmm. And in terms of work, my, what my clients want to achieve. And mm -hmm. that's my job as a coach, to help them with all my tools that I can give them to reach that goal. And most of the time, as you know it as well, the goal that we thought would be their main goal is in the end not. So loads of different goals actually surfacing and uh, yeah, it takes then a much deeper consideration on how to achieve them. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it really shows us how important it is to be clear on what the goal really is. Because as you were talking, I noticed 
that my ultimate goal, my ultimate agenda is the sustainability of the person that I'm working with and their well-being. And what they say they want to do is super important, but not at the price of their health not at the price of their actual self-detriment. So I, I just cannot push someone beyond their own boundaries too much when I know that it's going to actually destroy them. So mm -hmm. as a last point, I would actually like to ask you, Lars, how that works in the management world. I know that sustainability of the self might not be the prime um, motivation here. Okay, let me just ask you um, a question myself. So how do you know how far they can push? Hmm. Are you speaking out of your own experience? I or like how well do you know your clients to kind of protect them from harming themselves? I ask questions. So I don't assume that I know right. where they are going, but I will ask questions. If somebody starts becoming tired on a regular basis, can't be motivated, and their their mental well-being goes down, that is a pointer for me that they're not in the in the most efficient zone. So you've got the answer to your question. That's exactly what I do. What I just want to say is, I think we have to be a little bit careful if we're kind of talking about these things. What are we able to endure? Mm -hmm. What are our boundaries? What we can, yeah, what can we achieve? What can we, what is our determination reaching things? And then to kind of uh, taking our clients and comparing it with our clients. And this is a kind of thing that is uh, very specific. So I sh think we shouldn't fall into the trap of taking our personal boundaries, which should be healthy. I'm always talking about healthy boundaries and using our boundaries to kind of transfer them to our clients. So we as coaches have the obligation to find out about the healthy boundaries of our clients and then help them to kind of work to get the maximum out of their capacity in a very balanced and a very healthy way. I think that's what we both do. Beautiful. So let's summarize what we've discussed in this Take the Lead episode. We have agreed that there are different leadership styles and they're necessary at different levels, at the top executive level, a more decisive, maybe more masculine style uh, is what's necessary. But in a creative space, we might want to have a more collaborative style and take the time to actually nurture creativity and yeah, the, what we would now call the more feminine aspects. We talked about leadership really being based on personal leadership first. You must know how to lead yourself and you need to know how to actually follow and allow yourself to follow others. So everyone who leads needs to also follow. This is part of the, of the, of the game. And to lead yourself means that you develop a way to relate to yourself that helps you push forward but recognizes your healthy boundaries. Yeah, that's true. Let me just add one sentence that I learned um, very early in my professional life. And the sentence is, leaders are not born, leaders are made. So that gives loads of um, uh, aspiring leaders a very good chance on working constantly on their leadership, on their leadership skills, and uh, yeah, on their leadership kind of style as well. A natural born leader is a thing that's very rarely to find these days. So we all have a really chance to improve and to become really, really great leaders. Beautifully said, thank you so much. So we don't have to expect ourselves to be great from day one, but we do expect ourselves to keep improving. And that's probably one of the big factors of leadership. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching everyone. We really appreciate you being here. Feel free to send us your comments and your take on leadership and personal leadership in the comments below. And we shall see you in the next episode of High Tea. Until then, enjoy. Thank you very much and bye-bye.